want to invite you to bow with me so that we pray and plead for the grace of our Lord through the work of the Spirit in our hearts so that we receive his word. Let's pray. Our Lord and Savior, we pray for your word. We pray for our hearts. We pray as well that by your Holy Spirit, you will enable me as well to convey the truth. We heard as well from the reading of the scriptures, the truth, it is the very same truth that I also want to preach. And as I do that, Lord, I pray for your empowerment. I pray for the spirit to reach all who are gathered here today. I, preach, I pray for change. I pray for encouragement. I pray as well for the salvation of the lost. We trust your presence. We trust the power of your word, the gospel of grace, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I pray all these because of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we go through the scriptures, and you can also have experienced the same as you read through the scriptures, uh, you will learn that the Bible uh, recorded uh, people who were struck uh, with blindness. Uh, you go to uh, the Old Testament and you read the account in Sodom and Gomorrah. You read as well in Second Kings chapter 6. You find as well an army that was struck with blindness and uh, Elisha uh, led them as well to Samaria. In the New Testament, Elimus, as well as he was opposing the Apostle Paul, was struck with blindness. The same Apostle Paul, when he met the Lord on his way to Damascus, he saw the light, a very bright light. And by having that kind of an experience, he was struck with blindness for three days. He could not see anything until he was indeed helped. On the other side, as well, you learn that scripture also recorded people who were healed of blindness. Quite a number that you can read from the New Testament. And there is one in particular that we're going to look at even today in John chapter 9, who was healed of blindness. I want to really present this to you, and this is very, very true. You can concur with me that sight is a marvelous gift anyone need. And you, does, you do not as well want to lose your sight. It's so very true if you can just observe as well how many of us as well, even in this auditorium, are using glasses just to supplement the sight. We, we, we need to aid ourselves because we, we don't want to lose this wonderful gift that God has given us. You, you know, if you happen to lose sight, definitely, there are quite a number of things uh, that you miss. You, 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 you find yourself uh, missing to observe the beauty of nature. There are so many people who love uh, nature. You can also think about uh, the freedom to make personal choices. You're guided in so many other ways. And you, you, you're not really free uh, to make your own personal choices. The same applies even to movement. You lose the freedom of movement. There are so many um, uh, help that uh, blind people are receiving even today. But still, they are not free to move everywhere that they really want to go. Worse than that, you also find yourself missing Personal security, you're not really safe. You miss that. And not only safety, but how about human dignity? You wonder how many people really respect and value blind people. You lose that. Even if you might not be aware how people treat you and how they despise you. You're more like a scum of the world. You are nothing. And everyone can do anything. Good enough, at least there are a lot of protections uh, that are even extended to 
those who are disabled in that particular area. But let me ask you this question. How does it feel to be blind? How does it feel to be blind? Now, if you say you do not know or I have no idea, well, some of you might say, I, I, I really don't know. I, I have no idea. You might be saying that in your heart. You might have said that already. I, I, I have no idea. The issue is, is either you do not know yourself, or you are too blind to see your blind spiritual condition. Blindness is really frustrating. It's so depressing. It is one of those conditions that brings a lot of confusion in your own life. And you live in fear, and in many other instances, you're actually finding yourself struggling hard. For you might have learned in your walk, how you bump against other people, how you make decisions that are no way close to the will of the Lord, how you try this kind of relationship which is really unbiblical. So frustrating. That's why you are to come to a point of acknowledging even this morning that this is the worst scenario that you and I were born in. And if you are still in this particular condition, may God help you this morning to open your eyes that you may see. To open your heart, your spiritual heart, the eyes of your heart that you may see. The passage before us will show us that Jesus is the light of the world. The Lord Jesus gives sight and he gives life. He gives spiritual sight. He also gives spiritual life, but is also able to give physical sight. He's able to do that. But what I just want you to see in this section, it's, it will come clear, it will come clear, and I'm praying that it should come that clear, so that when you leave right here, you don't say, I did not really understand what you were talking about. Jesus is the light of the world. He gives spiritual sight. He gives spiritual life. And you need that. Let's go to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. It's a long section. 41 verses. And I want to try and cover all these verses, even though not dwelling in detail in each one of them. Some sections, I will just, that just point out what is in that uh, particular section uh, for you to go back and read, but you'll have enough at least to meditate upon, and you'll have enough as well to take out after this presentation or after this message. I have to go through the section rather than reading the whole of this. It will take close to four to five minutes, four minutes to read, but let me save that time and then set the context of this section, John chapter 9, just to set the context and we will flow through the section as we go. The event that we find in John chapter 9 is that of a man who was born blind 
And this section is placed right here and is close to the time where the Lord Jesus was about to go to the cross. I think he was left with approximately five months or six months. And after that, he was to be crucified. If you trace the context of this from chapter 7 to chapter 11, chapter 7 to chapter 11, you will notice that these sections are filled with the amounting hostility towards Christ. There was a lot of rejection of Christ by the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, the chief priests. They rejected Christ because of unbelief. And this unbelief was mounting. It was growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And they became more and more hostile to our Lord Jesus Christ. You will check in chapter 7, wherein they were naming him names and calling him in different character assassination terms. The Lord Jesus was called a demon-possessed person in John chapter 7, verse 20. He was called a product of fornication in John chapter 8, 41. The religious leaders called him a Samaritan and a man who had a demon in John 8, 48. And as that increased more and more, they kept on rejecting him. On top of that, you will also learn that the priest and the Pharisees were making all attempts to trap Jesus and even to kill him. I just want you to go with me in this section. Look, look with me in John 7, 1. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Look at verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? You go to John chapter 8, verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. In verse 59. Therefore they picked up stones, to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Go to John chapter 10, in verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Verse 39. Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. Go to chapter 11. Look at verse 53. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. Verse 57. Now the chief priest and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he was to report it so that they might seize him. For what purpose? To kill him. Growing hostility. More and more rejection of the Lord Jesus. Unbelief and gross unbelief was mounting in the hearts of the Pharisees and the chief priests and other Jewish leaders of the day. But what was the reason? Why do they really want to kill him? Why are they really hostile to Jesus? There's only one reason. The Jews, the Pharisees, and the chief priests, all the religious leaders of the day, did not want to accept. They did not want to believe that Jesus is God. All along, in the section that I just read, if you revisit those passages in chapter 8, what did Jesus say? Before Abraham was, I am. They picked up stones. In chapter 10, the Lord Jesus as well made a pronounce, some pronounce, pr pronouncement, I and the Father are one. They picked up stones to kill him. In the section before us, 
Jesus declared as well, that is the light. But not only that, he demonstrated. He demonstrated that he is indeed God in this section. By healing a man who was born blind, by performing a miracle of which the Pharisees and all those who were gathered around there, even though they saw the evidence, could not accept it. They could not believe it. They don't want to take it. You go as well to the next section in chapter 11. He did as well prove before the Jews that Jesus indeed is God by raising Lazarus from the dead. After four days, did they believe that? They didn't. They plot all the more to kill him. Unbelief. Unbelief. But what is the main issue? That's what you'll see here in this section. Spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness. Beloved, unless the Holy Spirit, unless the Holy Spirit works in your heart, unless the Holy Spirit illuminates your heart and open your spiritual eyes, you will never see yourself and you never see Jesus Christ. You need the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Otherwise, you remain blind and you continue to reject Jesus and you don't want to accept anything that he ever did. Even if he proved beyond any doubt that he is indeed God, you will still reject him. Let's look at the account. John chapter 9. As he passed by, if I were to divide this section, we can divide this in five sections, but let me just go through this uh, section by section. As I divided them, I'll focus on verses 1 to 5 and then look at the wrong judgment and the right perspective on disabilities. Verse 1, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. The Lord Jesus left the temple, as we saw in chapter 8, verse 59. Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Now as he passed by, he saw a man. The Bible says here, blind from birth. This man was born blind. He never lost his sight at some stage. He was born in this particular condition. And you can just imagine, this is a condition that his parents, his relatives, his neighbors, even the medical profession, and even some of the traditional leaders and doctors could not do anything to change it. And he himself, can do absolutely nothing to change this condition. Look at the verse. And his disciple asked him. Even the disciples noticed him. We don't know really if this man was always there. And they just passed him by all the time. We don't know about that. But at this point in time, even the apostles noticed, they observed this man. Not only Jesus saw that, but even the disciples who were with him saw him. And the disciples asked Jesus. Verse 2. A wrong question. A very judgmental kind of a question. To some, this is a very superstitious question, no doubt. Rabbi, they're asking, call Jesus Rabbi, he is indeed the teacher. Who sinned? This man or his parents? That he would be born blind. I think from the general theological understanding, we can all agree, we can all agree that blindness, sickness, death, suffering, all those are the effects of sin. All those are the effects of the fall. There's no doubt about that. In a general understanding of the scripture and the Bible, that's the effects of Genesis chapter 3. But if you notice what the apostles are asking, they really want to find out who actually sinned. Is this man the one who sinned and then 
he is suffering this disability, or else maybe the parents are the ones who sinned, and no wonder he was born like this. Tell us who actually sinned. Why are they really asking that? Why, why are they coming with this kind of questions? There's a lot that um, commentators uh, suggested, but let me just give you a few, maybe one or two. First, the disciples, as they are Jews, were already impacted by the reading of the scripture. They heard and they learned from Exodus 20 and even Exodus 34 that the Lord God made a pronouncement as well of saying, He will indeed punish those who sinned against Him. For the Lord will never leave any guilt unattended, any sin unattended. But He said to the fourth to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. He will then punish the grandchildren and the children of those who hate him. They, they definitely might have read that section and now they are looking at this and say, maybe that is really the evidence of one who sinned. But we're not so sure. Is this the man or is the parents? In that regard, they have settled the issue of the parents. But what about the man? There was also a belief among the Jews that um, infants, uh, they can still sin uh, in their mother's womb. How? We don't know. But they have developed that kind of an understanding as well. And they were promoting that. There was also a borrowing from the Jewish kind of, uh, the, the Greek culture, the understanding of the pre-existence of the soul. Some believe that souls are stored somewhere in heaven and God distributes the souls to different people. Now the other understanding was that if you receive a bad soul, chances are that you will be born with disabilities. And possibly they were to think, oh we heard about something from the other culture and now we want to make sure what happened. Who actually sinned? The Lord Jesus responded because he learned that the disciples as well are lacking spiritual insight. They do not understand all things. Look at verse 3. The Lord Jesus now is responding. Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents. None of that. Wrong question. And if you do have any kind of false accusation, you have to remove that from your mind. If you do have some other superstitious kind of beliefs, for that is very rife in some other cultures, whenever you see some disabilities, immediately you are thinking this person is bewitched. There's no doubt. There's someone who is behind this. The Lord Jesus said, remove that. There is neither this man or even his parents. What was the reason? Look at verse 3. But it was so that the mighty that the works of God might be displayed in him. That's the reason. And that's the purpose this man was born blind. The Lord God caused this man to be born blind for this particular reason that the Lord Jesus is to display the works of God in him. It does not mean that the Lord will display his mighty works on all disabled people who are blind today. But for this one, he was to be used as an experiment to display to the world that God is able to do the impossible. And Jesus was going to do exactly that. In verse 4, 5, the Lord Jesus switching here, explaining a few things in relation as well to what we just explained in verse 3. We must work the works of him who sent me. As long as it is day, night is coming when no one can work. He's inviting his disciples to join him in the effort of serving the Father. We are to do the work as long as the time is conducive. And he's saying night is coming in his mind. He's thinking the dark time is coming. It's a time when I'm approaching the cross and it will be so tough. And now we need to use this available opportunity in these few months. Let's do the works of the Father. Let's serve those that the Lord is exposing to us like this man. Let's display the works of God. 
Night is coming when no one can work. Verse 5, then he made this declaration. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. While I'm here, I'm the light of the world. I'm here to show the world that I'm able to give sight. I'm able to give light. I'm able to give life. And if that is true, the Lord Jesus in this statement, he's making a declaration to the apostles and even to this blind man. He was still there, by the way. I am God. I am God. I want you to get this. And I have to do this work and I will do it. The next verses, 6 and 7, is a clear display that Jesus indeed is the light of the world. Look at the verse. When he had said this, when he said that, when he made that statement, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes. I think the good part is the man is blind and he could not see that. Immediately when he starts spitting on the ground, so, oh no, what is happening? Maybe, maybe something else. It's worse when he mixed that clay and now he is anointing his eyes with that. So what is this? Is there no other way maybe to do things? But this is the only way that Jesus wanted to do it. You look at the verse there. He applied, anointed that clay to his eyes. And said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Again, there's something here very interesting. You're instructing a blind man to go and wash at the pool, and a particular pool, Siloam. How will he get there? Do you think he knows that? I don't care about You go wash and you wash at a particular place, the pool of Siloam, just go do that. Uh, best, but possibly he will ask some assistance. Uh, blind people used to ask some, uh, some assistance. But you don't hear the blind man asking questions. You don't hear the blind man arguing with the Lord Jesus. You don't hear any of that. And the Lord is just giving a very simple command. Go and wash and you wash at this pool. Another thing you want to observe, you don't hear in this particular section the Lord promising him anything. Did you hear the Lord promising him healing? He never said that. But he created an expectation from this man. And I think even the command that he gave to the Lord Jesus was cultivating faith, which must be evidenced by obedience. And this man is thinking, well, I've got mud already, and it makes sense for me to wash it away. But what is going to happen? I don't know. Maybe I might recover myself. He never told me that I'll be healed. He never said that. He just commanded him to go wash. If you notice, a simple obedience, a simple kind of faith that this man had, not questioning anything, but just taking the words of Jesus as they are. He obeyed the words. He followed the instruction of our Lord. He's not questioning, he's not arguing with the Lord. And that's what we expect as well in terms of our lives. A simple obedience. A simple act of faith. When you sing that song, uh, the, the, the song, Trust and Obey, there's a section right there, just taking him at his word. It just reminds us of what Mary told as well, the servants right there, when they were running out of wine. And Mary said, just whatever he says to you, you don't question him, just do it. Just do it. The blind man did that. He's blind. I want you to keep that in mind. He's blind physically and also spiritually, but he took Jesus at his words. What happened? He went. The Bible says he washed. What's the result? He came back seeing. 
What a miracle. What a mighty work of God. This is Jesus. What is he doing? He is showing to this blind man and to the apostles who are gathered right there that he is indeed the light of the world. And only God can open the eye of a man who was born blind. None of any other individual can do that. Only God. And it's so true as well, if you check, that the Lord was expecting nothing from this man, nothing from his parents. The only thing that he wanted to do is to fulfill what he mentioned in verse 3, the purpose of this man being born blind, to display the mighty work of God in him. And that was done. The following section, a long section, verses 8 to verse 34. That's the long, long section. Verse 8 to 34. That section, you'll notice, it deals with gross unbelief. It deals with clear rejection of the mighty work of God, which is also the rejection of Jesus. It is also a clear section that will prove to us how spiritually blind the Pharisees and the Jews and many others were gathered right there where really were. This is the section to prove that. And this section is proving what Jesus did is not accepted by the leaders. They are trying all all the more to invalidate the clear true miracle that took place. They tried by all means. You'll find here interrogation. They interrogated this blind man. They interrogated the parents. They brought him back again. They interrogated him. They could not believe. In fact, they choose not to believe. They don't want to believe. Let's look at the section. Verse 8. There are close to four groups here that you can identify that they were concerned about this man's sight. You have the neighbors in verse 8. You have others. We don't know who they are. The, the others, but in, uh, they are mentioned as others in verse 8. And then when you move on, you find the Pharisees in verse 13 and 15. You go to verse 18. Let me read this verse to us. The Jews did not believe it of him, that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight. The Jews did not believe. I think you faked this. I think this is fraud. That's why they interrogated the mind. Now let's look at the sections. Verse 8. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Is is this not the guy? Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but he he is like him. He he kept responding and saying, I am the one. Some translation, I am the man. I'm the one that you saw begging. Just like that, just to stop there for a moment. You don't hear these people praising God. You don't hear these people appreciating the work of God in him. Receiving sight is a marvelous thing. Everyone wants that. They were supposed to hug him and uh, celebrate. Great work has been done. Not at all. Not at all. Look at the next section there. So they were saying, the interrogation continues. How then were your eyes opened? Uh, How did that happen? (laughs) He answered. The man who is called Jesus, I don't know him exactly, but they they called him Jesus, made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received my sight. That's how. But I want you to observe there his explanation. The man called Jesus. He was not that much familiar with who Jesus is. He heard a little bit about him, and he called him the man called Jesus. Keep that in mind. He's the one who did this. He's explaining. Do you think they are satisfied? No. They said to him, where is he? 
He answered as well, I do not know. He sent me to go wash, and I wash, and I come, come back. He was no longer there, and definitely this man searched for his house. He went home. But they asked him, where is he? Where, where, where is Jesus? We don't care about your sight. Where is he? Look at the last verse. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now you wonder, why bring the man to the Pharisees? The other reason is, the only people who were so religious and who were knowledgeable during that day were the Pharisees. And they are the ones who can provide explanation. Explain this to us. You are the teachers of the law. You are the ones who understand the things of God. Now tell us, teach us, what happened? What, what could that be? Now it was a Sabbath of the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And then you can also tell immediately right there that Jesus claimed to be the Lord of the Sabbath. He is God. He can do anything at any time. He's in charge. Verse 15. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes and I washed and I see. You tend to think maybe they'll be satisfied. No, they're not. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. Others were persuaded, this man is strange. This man is unique. This man can work wonders. This man might be from God. Others said, no ways. There was a division even among themselves. That's not new. That's what always happened. Some will accept what Jesus did, others will reject completely. It's not new. It's still as well the same even today. Look at verse 17. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? How will you describe him since he opened your eyes? Do you have any, any explanation? Tell us, what is your perception? What is your view about him? Look at the answer. Verse 17, he is a prophet. That's how far he can say. That's how much he knows. He can only identify Jesus as a messenger sent by God. He can only identify Jesus as one of the prophets. He's possibly thinking, Elijah, Elisha, and some other prophets I had. They did so many, many wonders that this man is a prophet. Did you notice the transgression? At first he called him, the man called Jesus. But now they press him, what do you say about him? It's not like he's growing in his insight. He's a prophet. A prophet is a man sent by God. He's a man who speaks for God. He's a man who receives divine revelation from God and presents that revelation to the people. He's a man who can do wonders. Verse 18, the Jews did not believe. Of him that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received the sight. So oh, that's fine. Let's call the next group to interrogate. We need your parents. They brought the parents. We're not taking your testimony. We're not receiving anything you've said. In fact, we don't believe it up until now. They called the parents and questioned them, verse 19, saying, Is this your son? Who you say was born blind, then how does he now see? That's what we want to understand. They don't have an explanation as well. The neighbors, the relatives, other people brought the men to the Pharisees. They don't have an explanation. And now they're asking their parents. Maybe they do have an explanation. No, they don't. Look at the verse. His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he, now, he was born blind. We know that. But how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. We have no answer to that. We don't know who, we don't know how. Look at the safety. They're trying to protect themselves. They, wanted, they could have said so much. Definitely that man told them something. But look at the verse, trying to protect themselves. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. What that simply means he has passed the age of puberty. He has passed the bar mitzvah. He is treated by the Jews as a man. 
He can speak by himself and for himself. He can address you. You don't need to come to us. Just talk to him. But they do that intentionally because the verse tells us why they did that. Verse 22. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said he is of age, ask him. We don't want to interfere with this. Besides, we don't want to be excommunicated from the synagogue. We do have some information, but we reserve this information. Ask him. He's of age. Second round, interrogation. Are they convinced now? No. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. That is not an expression of say praise God. It's not an expression of saying worship God. The Pharisees were not thinking about that. What the Pharisees are saying here is, we plead with you please. Confess. Tell the truth. This is the last opportunity for you. Remember the account in Joshua chapter 7 when Achan stole those uh, uh, spoils? That's exactly the same words that Joshua used. Give glory to God. Confess your sin. Tell us the truth. That's what they're asking. We know that this man is a sinner. He then answered whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. You can engage in all this theological debate, I have no idea. One thing I know, there's only one. I was blind, and now I see. That's I know. I don't have theological debates. I can only share my experience. That which has happened to me. That which I know. That which I can experience even now and say, well, look at me, and I can tell you. But to debate issues, I have no idea. I don't, I'm not a scholar. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? This is really unfair. And it's continuing over and over and over and over and over again. At this point in time, the Pharisees have not accepted the mighty work of God. They are continuing rejecting. All that they are doing is to try and invalidate the mighty work of God. It is a sign of their unbelief and a gross rejection of who Jesus is. He answered, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? Now he's very bold in trying right, to persuade them. If you want to keep hearing this, you better be ready to be a follower of this man. They reviled him and said, verse 28, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. We have no idea. And they were lying. How do I know that? I know that because in John chapter 3, when Nicodemus visited the Lord Jesus, what did he say? We know, as the Pharisees, that no one can perform these signs unless God is with him. We're just choosing and making a deliberate rejection of this sign and a deliberate rejection of Jesus. We're just making that choice. We know. I love the response of this man. He, he, he's getting bolder and bolder. And he don't, he don't give up. He, he keeps on responding to the questions. He don't know that much, but the little bit that he knows, he will defend Jesus and he will testify about what happened and he will exalt the work that was done. Look at verse 31. Verse 30. The man answered and said to them, Well, there's an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of the time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. It has never been heard. If that has never been heard, is this not a clear testimony that God can do the impossible and nothing is too hard for the Lord? And the only answer is God did it. That's the only answer. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. That man is now convinced. It's not just Jesus. It's not just a prophet. He's so convinced in his mind, this man is from God. Verse 34, they answered him, 
you were born entirely in sin. And are you teaching us? So they put him out. What's the cause? Why put this man out? What exactly did he do? What is his sin? Nothing. Just for the mere fact that he's testifying about Christ, he's testifying about the truth, he's testifying about the mighty work of God, and he is himself the evidence. And they don't want that. They don't like that. They don't want to accept that. They're now accusing him and making as well a very important statement here, which they don't see themselves. They see that to others. You are entirely born in sin, they said. I think we need to pause there for a moment to look at that particular statement. In a way, they are telling the truth. In a way, they are describing who we are. It's only that they don't see themselves, but they can see others. And that's what a Pharisee is. They are so good in making judgment about other people, and they cannot judge themselves. They are very good in seeing the sins of others. They cannot see their sins. Are we not all entirely born in sin? Are we not all born spiritually blind? That's the starting point. I think that's what you are as well to acknowledge. You've got, you just need to start right there admitting. The Pharisees don't want to admit that. The Pharisees don't want to take that. This is the turning point of this story. Did you notice that from verse 8 to 34, Jesus does not appear anywhere? He made the statement in chapter 9, verses 1 to 5, and did the miracle in verses 6 and 7, and he disappeared from the picture. It's not there. It's not there. And look at the next section. That's why this is the pinnacle of this story. Now the Lord is going to appear. Now the Lord is going to show up in verses 35 to 41 as we look at this last section. Let's look at the section. Jesus had that they put him out. The message reached him. He was informed. The one that you healed was excommunicated by the Pharisees from the synagogues. He is cast out of the place of worship. He is removed by the religious leaders from worshiping God. He heard about that. The Bible says here, and finding him out, stop there for a moment, the Lord Jesus took the initiative to look for this man until he finds him. It becomes so clear to us because that's why the Bible is so true. Why did Jesus come anyway? He came to seek and to save the lost. The Lord Jesus came not for the righteous. He came for sinners that they may come to repentance. The Lord Jesus came to seek those who are spiritually blind, that he may give them sight. He sought for this man until he finds him. That's why you are to understand, until the Lord Jesus finds you, you'll never find him in any way that you can ever do. You can try so many other things. He just needs to find you. You don't need to find him. He's the one who took the initiative to look for lost sinners. And that's what we see here. He found him. I like this section. And then follow along with me here in this section. When he finds him, he asks him one important question. It's a question that is asked emphatically. It is directed to him and him alone. It is a question that he must give an answer. He is to make a decision. And as much as the Lord Jesus tried to display his deity, his Godhood to the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and they rejected him because of their unbelief, now he's posing a question to this man. Look at the question. Do you believe in the Son of Man? The reading of this section is, you, do you believe in the Son of Man? So many rejected me. Now what about you? He can deal with one person and leave the rest 
Leave the majority who are right there who rejected him. But there's only one person, and that's the last one that he can ask at this point in time. Do you believe in the Son of Man? You wonder how much knowledge this man had. I believe you don't have much knowledge. I don't think he's got a lot of theology at this point in time. In his description of Jesus at the beginning, the man called Jesus. The prophet. Well, it's a man I believe is coming from God. And now he's asked a very theological question. Do you believe in the Son of Man? This is the title that is used in the Gospels. Especially the Gospel according to Luke. Luke portrays Jesus as the Son of Man. Emphasizing that Jesus is a perfect human being. He had body. He can get tired. He can eat. He can do all other things that human beings can do. And also experience human limitations. But when I read this, I don't think the Lord Jesus was only expressing that element of his humanity. I think in this section, the Lord Jesus was thinking of Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. The section that displays Daniel saying, The Son of Man, high and lifted up, the one who had dominion and who is the ruler of all these things. In fact, the Lord Jesus is bringing to this man, Do you believe in God? That's basically what he's asking. John used this title of Son of Man several times in the Gospel. And the Lord Jesus used this title during his trial. The chief priest asked him, are you the son of God? You tell us now, and I put you under oath. Jesus said, from now on, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high. And the chief priest said, no more question. Death sentence. What was he saying? I am God. You will see God sitting on his throne one day. And you will see him coming as well in his glory. Now he's asking the man, do you believe in God? Do you believe that I am God? Look at the answer. He answered, who is he, Lord? Who is he? He's not asking, where is he? Who is the son of God? I have no idea. I'm not a theologian. I, I, I don't know much. Just tell me or show me who the Son of Man is. I am ready, I'm willing to do what? To believe. Unlike the interrogators. They have no idea. And still, they don't want to. Why? Blinded by their own sin. The Lord is start working on this man. Look at the verse. Jesus said to him, you have both seen him. And is the one who is talking with you. He's the one who is right in front of you. This is God in the flesh. This is the Son of Man, the Son of God, the I Am. This is the image of the invisible God right in front of you. And this is the one who is talking to you. I'm the one who is asking you, do you believe in me? I'm the one talking. The message is sinking in and this man has no other option to, rather than to acknowledge all that he had and to respond positively. Look what he did. Look what he did. Verse 38. And he said, Lord, I believe. I don't know much. That's why, beloved, you don't need a diploma of theology to believe in Jesus. You don't need a bachelor of theology to believe in Jesus. You just need the knowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of Man. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is the one who went to the cross, died for our sins, rose from the dead. He's alive. You just need that and believe. This man believed. This is the turning point. Just pause for a moment. The Lord Jesus displayed He's the light of the world. How did He do that? He opened His physical eyes. First miracle. Do you believe in the Son of Man? I believe. The second miracle. Jesus opened His spiritual eyes and this man can see. And no wonder he believed. That's the turning point in the life of this man. He testified. By his life, and he can also testify by words. 
But most of the work that was done in him is a display of the mighty work of God in him. I believe. What's the result? Look at the result. For those who believe, look at the result. Verse 38. And he worshipped him. He worshipped him. Beloved, you don't just worship Jesus. You worship him when you see who Jesus is. You worship when you know who Jesus is. You worship when your spiritual eyes are opened, when the Holy Spirit has worked in your heart, removed the blindness that you are born with, and now you can see Jesus. And you are left with nothing else, one thing, and one thing alone that you have to do is to worship him. Because you notice he's worthy of worship. He demands worship from his creatures. All those who saw him worshipped him. When the apostle Peter was fishing, he didn't have a catch. Jesus came and said, cast the net on the other side. When he saw the mighty works, Peter said, depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Let's part ways here. You go the other side, you're too holy. I cannot really come closer to you. But the difference comes. When he rose from the dead, Thomas was not with them when he made his appearance. And when he appeared, the Lord Jesus said, Thomas, come here. Do your experiment. Put your fingers on my marks here. He didn't do that. My Lord and my God. In worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. He cannot help but worship him because he sees who Jesus really is. The disciples, when he rose from the dead, the Lord Jesus met them in Galilee. And the Bible says they saw him and some worshipped him and others doubted. Do we still have doubters today? Many doubters of who Jesus is. Those who saw him, they cannot help but worship him. We don't know exactly what he did. Possibly he bowed down, he prostrated himself before Jesus, and I like this, Jesus did not stop him. You know why? He's God. He's worthy of worship. He receives worship. That's what spiritually born people do. That's what those who are enlightened by the Holy Spirit do. Those who can see, they do. But those who don't see, they keep rejecting Jesus. Because of their spiritual blindness. Look at the last section there. Verse 39 to 41. That's an indictment. This is, beloved, an indictment. You don't want to be in this side. You really don't want to find yourself in this side. You, you better experience the salvation, which is a spiritual side that you receive from the Lord, and also the spiritual life you receive from the Lord, because it's the light of the world. He gives sight. He gives life. You don't want to find yourself in this situation, or you don't want to stay in this condition. Look at the verse 39 to 41. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Huh. That's a serious indictment. If Jesus is light, he gives life, he gives sight. If you accept that, you are blessed. If you reject that, he brings more blindness to your heart. Remember Pharaoh in Exodus? He hardened his heart. What did Jesus, the Lord did? He hardened him more. That's what Jesus is saying here. But further than that, read the verse. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, we are not blind to, are we? I don't think you're addressing us here because they always claim that they are complete, they are perfect, they lack nothing, they have a relationship with God, they are in the kingdom, they don't see themselves, they don't see their sinfulness, they don't see Christ, they don't accept him. We are okay. Look at the verse, the last verse. Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. That's an irony, by the way. But since you say we see, your sin remains. What is he saying? If you accept, if you acknowledge that you are spiritually born blind, if you accept that, if you believe that, 
you will cry to God and ask the Lord to open your eyes that you may see. You will cry for help. And the Lord who hears your prayers and who sees your heart uh, that is seeking as well something, he will guide, he will help, but only do that, he will give you sight and he will give you life. Only if you see. If you don't see that, look at the verse. You remain in your sin. Because if you see your spiritual blindness, as you plead from the Lord, he saves you. He forgives you of your sins. He washed away your sins. But if not, you remain in your sins, and what is left is nothing but judgment. You remain in your sin. You remain in your blindness. And the end is not that good. That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. And that's why I'm saying, you don't want to be on this side. You don't want to be like them. And you don't want to be in this particular condition. But what do you need to see to be saved? What is it that you must see to be saved? Let me give you two things. And this, I believe, they're the only things you need. Two. Number one, you need to see yourself. What do I mean? You need to see your sin and your sinfulness, your blindness. You must see your pride, your unbelief, your idolatry. You are to see your faults and all that you have done against the Lord. That is unpleasing to his sight. You see yourself. If you don't see yourself, you don't see your sin and your sinfulness, your unbelief, your rejection of Christ continuously, hence you have the word and you've been exposed to the truth. If you don't see that, there's no hope. You have no hope. You got to see yourself first. Stop trying to see and find faults in other people like the Pharisees. See yourself. Focus on yourself time and again. And then you have to look up. You have to look up. There's a song here by Bob, Bob Coughlin. Oh, great God. Let me read this stanza. I was blinded by my sin, had no ears to hear your voice, did not know your love within had not taste for heaven's joy. Then your spirit gave me life. Open up your word to me. Through the gospel of your, so your son, gave me endless hope and peace. That's the condition of a spiritual blind person. Blinded by his own or his own sin. Cannot see Christ until God opens the eyes. Until the Holy Spirit penetrates through the gospel that is preached and you can see yourself and see how sinful you are. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, he saw himself and he cried, Woe is me, I'm undone. I said, Judgment is coming right here. He said, No, wait, we'll deal with that. We're going to deal with that. And the sins were atoned, saved. The prostitute could not help herself, sitting on the feet of Jesus. As she saw herself, she was just weeping trying to wipe the tears by her, by her, her, her uh, on Christ's feet, and she just keep on weeping and weeping and weeping. Why? She saw herself. I'm not worthy. I'm a sinner. And the Lord Jesus said, your sins that are many are forgiven. You go home in peace. It's only when you see yourself. It starts right there. The second thing, you must see Christ. You don't just see yourself, you are to see Christ, your Savior. And because you see yourself and you are now in need. And Christ Jesus is your only answer to your condition. He's the only answer. No other answers that you can receive. You must then be able to see Christ. He's your Savior. And it comes through the gospel. And that's what you'll see. He's Lord. He's the Son of God. He is the Son of Man. He's the final word. The I am the image of the invisible God, the resurrected one, the one who is still alive even today. You are to see him. And when you see him, he will give you sight. He will give you life. Let me read these two stanzas as well that you know very well and that should be your prayer this morning. This should be your prayer. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, 
I want to see Jesus. I want to see him. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing. Holy, holy, holy. Because that's what Jesus is. Open my eyes that I may see how holy you are, but how good you are as well. There's a song as well by Tim Hughes. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes. Let me see beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say you are my God. Altogether worthy. Altogether wonderful to me. You better say Jesus after seeing yourself and plead for God to open your eyes. He is the light of the world. He is able to give life, to give sight to all those who are spiritually blind. I think by now you know and you can examine yourself and you can see your spiritual blindness the evidence is so clear. There's no way you can deny this as well. As a sinner sitting here this morning, you cannot deny that. As those who claim to be saved, and even for those who are saved, you know what? We all need perfect sight. We need the Lord to always clean out the lenses of our eyes that we may see clearly. We need that. The Apostle Paul, as he pleaded with the church in Ephesus, he said, I pray that the eyes, the eyes of your heart will be enlightened that you may see the will of the Lord and the goodness of who the Lord is. But for the unsaved, it's so clear. If you're still finding yourself not saved, rejecting Christ because of unbelief, it's a clear sign of spiritual blindness. Do you have opportunity? Jesus is the only answer. If you see yourself, you see him, you plead for spiritual insight, spiritual sight, spiritual life. He provides that. May God really help us as we look at ourselves and look at the Lord Jesus. He is the light of the world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming. But we thank you as well for revealing yourself as the light of the world. You give life and light, which is sight, to all who believe. We plead for your grace, we plead for your mercy even today. For those who are spiritually blind, that you work in them and because they know themselves and they can see themselves and they don't want to continue in that path. Save them, we pray. We pray for ourselves as those who are saved. We lack spiritual insights in so many other issues. Help us to see ourselves when we even visit the scripture to see ourselves and to see you, and so that we can serve you clearly with great joy and with great confidence. But we thank you for your mighty work and the enablement by the Holy Spirit to believe that Jesus is indeed God, and we can testify that he is our God. And we were blind, and now we see. Receive our worship, for you demand that from us as those who see you. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.